It was a few years ago, and I actually started making a list of everything that was known about me. Everything that was tracked or captured or measured, and I scored it on an Excel spreadsheet by how easy or how hard it was to find. And um, you know, I started by Googling myself, and then I thought about my credit card, and then I thought about every time I drive to the Easy Pass, and right, every time I got on the MTA. I mean, not just things in the digital world, but things in the real, regular world. And uh, I got you know, every bit of metadata, everything that was known, and I got hundreds of items on this list. I even, um, I even did a FOIA request for my FBI file. <laughs> and, you know, after, I, it was long. I mean, it was, and then it became, as an artist, you sort of obsess, and it's kind of a thing. And I, uh, I mean, I even realized, you know, everything from the list of what I pick up at the pharmacy to the watch that keeps track of my skin temperature, which is super telling. Don't, you people who have a watch, and it's, they know everything that you're doing. And, you know, it was even just a few months ago I realized Amazon knows how fast I read. Because my Kindle. They know whether I cheat. <laughs> and look at the end. You know, and so I thought, well, how, you know, all right, here's this list. How do I feel about this? And I thought, it's actually a more complex list than I can even remember. It's, more, it's a more complex picture of me than I let other people see, more than I can even like, admit to myself. And I thought, how's this going to go? What's the future of this? How's it going to feel? And I thought, should I worry? How's it going to go? And I realized, you know, I've always been kind of curious about how things are going to turn out, how it's going to go in the future. When, when I was a little kid, I couldn't wait to grow up. I'm the one that's not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I was so envious of my older sisters. I just thought their, you know, their world was just so much more interesting. When I was in school, I, um, I was always the tallest one in the back row. You can see me at the very top. Right, they used to, do you have, I don't know, do they still do these? They line you up by size. Right, and I have year after year after year. I am the last one in the last row. I even think I'm taller than the boy standing next to me. And I'm so I'm eight years old here, and um, I can remember, you know, it's almost like I wanted to grow up and grow into that size. You know, when I was 13, I grew six inches in a single year. And people think, oh yeah, it's great to be tall. And honestly, I can remember it was horrible. And it was almost like my body grew faster than the person inside. You know, and maybe, you know, it was like I just didn't feel like I fit. I didn't feel like I it just, I can remember feeling so uncomfortable as a kid. And I thought, well, maybe if I could see the future, I could see what I would become. I could start to figure it out. And I think we leave clues. I mean, I think through our lives, we, we sort of give ourselves clues. It took me multiple times in college to figure out my major. I switched three different times. I've moved to so many different cities. I've held a bunch of different jobs. I mean, for a while, I, um, 20 years, I worked in high tech, uh, almost always running um, organizations in really big computer companies. For, and there was one, I mean, there was sometimes you really leave yourself really perfect clues. For about five years, I ran, um, it was an R&D group and a marketing group that only worked on future products. And then after that 20 years, I switched, I switched again. It was a big switch. Um, and it's like, who am I? I switched and I went back to art school. I went to, bed, I went to graduate school to become an artist. And at the beginning, when I started making art, these are all my, you figure this out, right? I'm showing my work as we go. Um, when I started making work, I, um, I started making work about time and imagined time. Time forward, backward, and something had felt like it had shifted. Time had turned into these tiny, tiny little bits. And I started to 
just really examine and think about time. And I knew from my engineering background that if you really want to study something, you measure it. So I was like, all right, I'm going to really keep track of my time. You're right, write it down. I don't know if you've ever, I mean, some people journal and keep track, but it is really, really hard to keep track of every minute and every day and know what you're doing. So I Googled it. You know, I, it was like unbelievable. I actually found this guy that had been keeping track of all of his time for years. Ben Lipkowitz. This is like a direct lift off of his site. I couldn't, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I just loved it. It was like his, his imagining time and his tracking time was just the way I had laid it out. I mean, I'd always thought of it as these tiny little bits. And every horizontal is 24 hours, color-coded by activity. Green is when he's eating, red is when he's online, when he's coding. And I scraped it. I grabbed every bit of it, I didn't hesitate. I feel like an artist. <laughs> I started making work. It was cut, painted, cut wood. And I thought his time was just so beautiful. It kind of sits on this diagonal. It's almost like it's pushing forward, it's leaning forward. Well, he sleeps on a 26-hour day. He squeezes just a couple extra hours out of every day. It's kind of curious. He works as a software developer, so he can work and sleep whenever he wants. That's what your guys do, correct? <laughs> And I really, I thought it was just gorgeous. I made a lot of work out of this data, but I thought, no, 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 I can do this. I can figure out how to measure my own time while I'm sleeping. So I got a sleep monitor. It was this super accurate EEG from Zio, and I started tracking myself. And I got a chance to see my own data. And I was, I, I mean, I'll tell you straight, I was really surprised. And, I, the, and, and there was a part of me that was like super disappointed because I had always, you know, the story I told myself is I'm this really good sleeper. And it turns out I was like barely average. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you have to confront. It was this moment, it's like, all right, this is real data. It's telling me something about myself. You have to really confront. And I also realized it's just so hard to see yourself. And I also, um, I was also really curious to see to see actual sleep patterns. Um, I always thought sleep were these really big chunks, but it turns out waking, sleeping, it's not so different when you really see. It's like these little five and 10 minute bits. But I didn't want to be the only one that was strapping this thing on my forehead every night, so I got one from my husband, Mark. <laughs> I mean, I ended up measuring like um, almost a thousand nights of sleep, so I wore that for years. And um, he goes, okay, Lori, uh, just you wait, just you wait and see. I am a terrible sleeper. Um, it turns out he's an amazing sleeper most of the time. He's, he puts on the first night, he, gets a, he scores 140. I'm like barely getting scores in the 60s. And it turns out that he sleeps great most of the time. But sometimes he sleeps really terrible. But he only remembers the bad. And I thought, oh, that's so him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, OK. What if somehow by capturing your data, you could almost sort of capture your personality? So I, I, I took the sleep data, and I started to you know, create a rule system. It's almost like an artist's algorithm. You know, color had meaning size, right, started to actually create a whole system for how to take the data and turn it into something that was visual. And in this case, I took the light sleep, which is kind of known as trash sleep, it really doesn't do that much for you, and I folded it up and got it out of the way, and, and really just left the deep sleep and REM sleep, and made a, a whole bunch more hand-built work, and it all went in a show in Los Angeles. I ended up getting a ton of press. And the company that made that little sleep device emails me. <laughs> Hi, Lori. What can we do to help you? <laughs> I was like, wow. I mean, because I had, right? I just bought this on the regular. Okay. So they write. Think about it, and I go, more data. So I write back, send me more data. 
And it was the first chance I got to see my data compared to others. So I ditched their graphics. I, you know, I dumped this all. This is just conditional formatting in Excel. And the purple is the really good stuff. That's deep sleep. The orange is when you're waking up. Every horizontal is a night of sleep. And the length of it is hours. So you can kind of see this 26-year-old woman, super efficient. She's getting tons of deep sleep. She's short. She's on. And then you look at this guy, 46-year-old, right? He's sleep a ton of time. And he's waking up all the time. Terrible sleep. But I looked at these and I thought, these are these are like pictures of them. They're almost like a fingerprint. It's like a portrait of this person, a data portrait. And so I started to think of these in my own mind. It's like, okay, this is like a new type of data selfie. <laughs> and I thought, I'm on to something. I really, I was really energized by this. I thought, all right. I'm going to double down. I'm going to measure everything. <laughs> I'm going to just write. I'm going to go to town. I'm going to write. I'm on a mission. And uh, you know, I can almost like live in the future where gadgets are going to capture everything about us. You know, little things we swallow. It's not just the watch, but it's the tattoo on your skin. It's the clothes you put on. It's everything you touch. It's everywhere you go. The world of just ambient measuring. Let me try that out and, and try to live in the future and really, really, really pay attention. And, you know, it's kind of, I mean, in some ways, it's really what an artist does. You experience the world that you really care about, and then you try to take that experience and those feelings and explain them to others. So it, I also, I mean, I'll be truthful with you, I also have this fantasy. I've read books about this. I've studied this whole thing. I have this fantasy that if an artist sees something real, that it, it can actually sometimes turn into real science. Years later, they'll actually prove some crazy idea that the artist felt or, or experienced or, or saw in their work. So I study patterns in the data. And I really fixate on the things that were, it was almost like um, this reflection that the data was somehow a reflection of you. The proportions of you, like a neural Fibonacci. It, and, and particularly things that are unconscious that you don't think about. They're not, right, these are not conscious choices. There's almost this weird proportions of your brain, of your mind. And, I, I mean, I saw really, we, we cluster. We, we tend to go the same places. We like routine. We repeat ourselves. We go back over and over and over. And you know, at the beginning, I thought I'd be able to figure out the correlation, and find cause and effect, and look at you know how much did I spend, and how many steps did I take, what was my mood, that, and realize that humans are really noisy data objects. It's you know the, the differences are so subtle it's hard to read us, and it caused me to just sort of let go of that, and then just think about these as patterns themselves. You know, what's the rhythm of this data? How does it feel? And I thought, well, what would it be like if it's not something I look at, but I could actually step in and experience these really large scale, okay, pay attention, almost like textured walls. What if it was like intelligent wallpaper, bumpy, right, in the spaces that we live? And I thought, well, that's not, right? I sort of I have this whole fixation about the future. What if, it, what if they're really, you know, they're 3D printed, maybe they're laser cut? But lately, I've really started to look into biofabricated. In fact, Mark and I went up to um, a synthetic biology lab up in Boston and we talked to the scientists there and said, OK, you know, how hard would it be to take you know, color, road, and volume? This company designed organisms like you know, volume print and actually grow this stuff on your wall based on sensing data. And they look at me as like, oh, yeah, totally. Not good, for sure. And so, you know, I started to think, well, all right, this could be wall space. And, you know, it's like the produce section of the market. You sort of spray them down and, you know, they'll dissolve and, you know, reformulate. You know, you move to a new apartment, you just fold them up and recycle them, grow a new one in a new place. So after some months, my studio was filled with these patterns, cut, drawn, right, lots and lots and lots of them. And I thought, well, all right, I'm paying attention. How does it feel? And I thought, well, they feel, they feel human. They 
feel organic. They felt personal. They felt weirdly recognizable. There was almost like there was this fluency. Somehow it was like this subconscious recognition of me. I thought, well, how did, you know, and I thought, it's almost soothing. And I thought, I like it. I thought, well, maybe that's the whole point. Patterns are a way to see yourself. You take your data and present it back as the language of art. You know, art, art makes data sticky. <coughs> it gets you to look longer in a way that charts and graphs never can. It holds you. It carries emotions. There's feeling in it. You know, um, humans are pattern recognition machines. You know, we love patterns. We live for pattern. Numbers are such abstract concepts, but we recognize pattern intuitively. We feed on pattern. So maybe that's exactly what happens. In the future, it's your data abstracted from you and played back to you as pattern in the form of art. And I get away to get all my data. Not just the stuff I measure, but all the data, everything, all of it. And I use it to understand who can I be. It's just so hard to see ourselves. It's just so hard to know. There was one time um, I was at an artist residency. This is where artists go for a couple of months. You go live in the woods, you make work. And uh, we would sit around late at night. Usually alcohol was involved. And we would psychoanalyze each other based on the work, the work that we made. And, and we'd psychoanalyze other artists, but still, honestly, this actually works for anybody's work. So, tuck this thought away. And, you know, one of the artists looks at me and says, Laura, you've got a Fitbit on, you've got the watch, you're, you're peeing on the script, you're doing all these things. Laura, you're, you're trying to figure out who you are. And then I thought, I think we all are. I think we all are trying to figure out who we are. You get a new job. <laughs> You move to a new city, you get a new apartment, you get a new boyfriend. It's just so hard to know in advance. Are they going to like me? Am I going to like them? How's this going to turn out? It's just so hard to know. You try things out in the real world to see. So when I look at the future and I think about this decade, all this data that's collected about us, it just, I just don't think it's going to be about targeted marketing or Google advertising. You know, even 10,000 steps with my fit. I just don't think it's about fitness. I think it's something much more personal, much more human. I think it's going to be about identity. Who am I? It's going to be a new way to see ourselves. It's using technology as a shortcut to mindfulness, a way to boost our immune system. Because I don't think your brain can see the difference between meditative self-reflection you know, um, and the intake of a data selfie. But if I haven't got you coaxed into this like irresistible yet, the thing I think will really flip it is overcoming this feeling of powerlessness. There's a friend of mine that just did research um, just, it's just been filtered this year, looking at how people consume data and how they feel about it. And 85% of us are uncomfortable with the data that's collected about us. But 66% of us have given up. We've thrown in the towel. I'm getting measured and all I'm getting is some lousy ads. <laughs> but what if we can take back our data, reclaim it? It's not about getting paid for it. It's about overcoming the opacity, the one-sidedness. I see a future where companies are pressured to give it back to us, to make it two-way. I want my data. You know, I talk with companies about this, and I think what's stopping them is they don't, they don't know how to give it back to us. And I've had them say, well, what would somebody do with it? I, it, I just think it's so much simpler than that. 
I think social pressure will coerce companies to share our data back with us. And I think an ecosystem of apps will let us play with it. What if it looks like art in the spaces that we live? The whole bonus is to our immune system. I want my data. I want what I dreamed as a little kid, to be able to see into the future and to see who I could become. Data is irresistibly powerful to human understanding. Let's take back our data and turn it into art. Thank you.